I'm pushing the live now. Hello, and welcome to Jason Cabinets Experience. I'm your host, Jason Cabinets. Our guest today is Marie Karras. Maria, are you ready to be great today? I am very ready to be great today. Maria is, a, is passionate about combining family life entrepreneurship. She runs a virtual assistant training program and client matchmaking service where she helps women who want to work from home using skills they already have to start marketing and launch their virtual assistant business. She then helps these women find clients by matching them with business owners looking for virtual assistants, allowing them the freedom to spend time with their families and become successful in their professional endeavors. We are thankful for being here today. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Jason, for having me. It's great to be here. So, Maria, first, let's talk about, you know, and this is my point of view. I th everyone thinks VA is a good, good, great idea, right? But I think some mm -hmm. owners are struggling, like, you know, I know I need a VA. I, I have this, this, these tasks I need, I need someone to do. But, man, the cost, right? They're, they're going back and forth the cost. They, I mean, they realize the money would be great, a great spin. But how do you convince or talk a small business owner to do that? Well, Whenever you're growing your team, it's an investment, isn't it? You're investing in growing your team so that you can gain your time back. And really, that's what I tell business owners. If you want more time, and who doesn't, right? If you want more time to focus on your clients, to on growing your business, on really the revenue generating tasks, you need to step out of working in your business and get someone to do that for you so that you can work on your business and growing it. So you can get VAs fairly um, no, I'm not going to say cheaply, but they're quite affordable and you know, they're not like a full-time employee. So they're essentially almost like a write-off for your business. Um, and the cost is just completely is outweighed by the benefits of hiring a virtual assistant. When you have someone who takes off the day-to-day -day tasks in your business, like the marketing stuff, the customer service emails, you know, the invoicing, the chasing, the invoicing, all of that small stuff, like you need to hand that off your plate so that you can focus on the real revenue generating tasks. So the cost shouldn't even come into it because you know it's priceless when you get that time back. So Maria, when, I, when someone brings a VA, is a VA like an extra employee of the company, a 1099, or they outsourced? How does that part work? They're or usually outsourced. Yeah, so they will kind of come in on a like a contract basis. I don't know how it works in the in the U.S. so much. I'm I'm based in the U.K. Uh, and I work with like European clients, but they're very much contractors. Um, so you don't, so they pay their own insurance and all of that stuff. And you just kind of pay their either hourly wage, wage or, um, a package rate and things like that. Yeah. So, so the VAs that you, you, you match, match with and, and work with, how do you actually find them? Well, I, I do a, a, a training program where I invite women who are either, um, new moms or women who are in corporate and who want to leave corporate so that they can have more flexibility in their life. And I basically find them, uh, I do a challenge every three months or so, a five day launch your virtual assistant business challenge. And I invite women who are interested in the life of flexibility, of freedom, and to build, you know, a life to where they can build their own business and earn money on their own terms. And I invite them to take part in my five day challenge. And through those five days, we go through um, all the skills that you need to start your virtual assistant business. And then they join, once they finish that five day challenge, they're invited to join my inner circle membership where we um, really dig deep into all the skills that you need um, to function and serve your clients in a professional manner as a virtual assistant. So everything from client relationship management um, to social media marketing to bookkeeping we'll have trainings and workshops in our inner circle uh, for the VAs to really brush up on those skills and then we um, we know our VAs very very well in our in the membership so we get to know they're not just numbers they are um, you know I get to know them personally I get to know their strengths and then I'm able to match them with business owners who come to us looking to hire. Maria, do most VAs just have one person they're working for, they have multiple clients, or is that like a limit a they VA will, can handle? Well, they can, they will, they will typically work with multiple clients um, because some clients will give them a few hours here, like 10 hours here, 20 hours there. So they'll need to um, really get enough hours from clients so that they can make a full-time income. 
unless they're lucky and they get that unicorn client who will kind of give them all the hours um, so that they can meet their income goals. But um, essentially a VA will have sort of three or four or even five clients at a time. Um, but if, if a business owner wants the full attention of VA, they have to be prepared to pay for it. And it is it's definitely worth the investment. And of course, you have to, as a business owner, you have to tread that fine line between hiring someone full time and, and on a contract basis, because there's a certain number of hours that you, you can't really give to a VA if you're only hiring them as a contract as a contractor. Otherwise, if, I think if you go over 40 hours a week, then they're, they should be on a full time contract with you. How often does it happen mm. where like a small business owner like, like has a great VA and, and he says, you know what, I want to have you on my, my team full time. So except the, just after the VA relationship, you just come up with me full time. How often does that, does that happen? Oh, come on full time? Yeah. Um, that happens quite a lot, actually, because when you when you hire a VA, you're really hiring someone to be when well, the solopreneurs that we work with, they're really hiring someone to be their like right hand person. So when someone becomes a part of your business in that way, where they kind of become indispensable, you don't want to share them with anybody else. So they do, it's quite, it's quite common to bring a VA on full time and they'll take on a more, um, a role that has more responsibility and they'll move up in the company. So it's a great way. I tell all my VAs, it's a great way to kind of make your way into a company and then potentially sort of get yourself a full-time role um, even in a management position, if you start as a virtual assistant. So it's really quite exciting for, for both sides. Yeah. How do you... business... yeah. Oh, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say for a business owner, you don't have to commit like straight away. When you're hiring, you're kind of committing a little bit to bringing someone on full time. But with a virtual assistant, you're kind of going on an hourly basis. So you're really kind of having that opportunity to feel each other out and see if you're a good fit personality wise before you have that conversation where you potentially might bring them on full time. So Marissa, how do you, how do you make sure, like, like you said, how you make sure, I mean, being a good match is probably very important. How do you make sure, make sure the, the VA and the business owner is a good match beforehand? How do I know they're a good match? So. We know well, it's it's not always a perfect match. It's very much we advise for our the, the clients who come to us looking for a virtual assistant that they um, that they do interviews and sort of chemistry tests in the way with three or five three or four VAs that we send across to them, and we match them basically on a time zone is a huge thing. If that's a it's, if that's an issue for the client, if that's an important thing for the client, then we'll look at our VAs who are in the right time zone. We'll look at their skill sets. We'll look at their sort of personality as well. And we'll make the suggestions to the client, you know, this is someone you should speak to. We think you'd be a great fit. Um, and they kind of take it from there. And then the business owner will do their own interviews and essentially um, do their own research as to whether this this virtual assistant is a good fit for them. But we will provide them that first selection for them to choose from. Maria, so now we've been working remotely for a while now, but I'm mm -hmm. a firm believer a lot of people still don't know how to work remotely. Do you find yeah. yourself having to like, train up small business owners how to work remotely and like train them like so much kind of tools that have to use with VA? It, it's, yeah. I think so. Well, the, the kinds of clients that we've been working with are mostly online business owners. We haven't had too many people who've come from sort of brick and mortar and in-person businesses come to us. Uh, but that it, it actually is more and more, we're kind of seeing more and more of those. And we do have to, I kind of feel like that's an extra service we can provide, like transitioning your business from brick and mortar to online. Like there's a thing there that I think there's an opportunity there. And um, it, it is, it is interesting <laughs> that opportunity to teach them about all of the online skills that for us, well, I've been in online business for like 10 years now, at least. So I know all the tools. I know what's being used right now. And it's astounding to me, the people who come into online business and they're completely new to it. And they've never heard of these tools where for us, it's like second nature. Like a lot of our clients hadn't even heard of Zoom um, six months ago, whereas yeah. I've been using Zoom for years, which is insane. So you have to kind of train them on these tools that they've never even heard of. So there's a little bit of a, a lift there, I think. So Maria, so two part question, I hope you, ha you haven't had to deal with this, but what do you do if like suppose first part, the small business owner comes to you and like complains, quote unquote, complains by the VA. And what do you do if the VA complains by the small business owner? Do you just like do, do different matches or how do you work through that? 
Well, we kind of, we don't really manage the relationship after we um, match the business owner with their VA. We are essentially the matchmaker and then we leave them to it. So we're not responsible for any of the the, the, any of the work or the relationship with the VA afterwards, we kind of leave it, we leave it there. So um, it's never happened to us before that anyone's come to us and com have, have complained about the VA that we've matched them with. It is up, it really is the, the business owner's responsibility to pick a VA that's right for them. And then, then we're out of it. That's it. It's kind of like a dating app, you know, <laughs> where we kind of match are over kind of a platform where we can match them, but then that's it. We leave them to it. So Maria, like anything else, it's like, it's like there's, there's so many, all these people doing SEO, all these people doing marketing, all these people doing sales. Now it's like these, all these companies popping up, like doing VA resources, you know, VA marketing, VA um, items. How should a small business owner like pick the right VA company for themselves? How do they, there's so many, right? There are so many. I think the way that I approach it with my business is, I'm very much the face of my business. So I will speak to the business owners. I will have a lot of sort of personal relationship with these clients who come to us. They've either, they've even, they've either seen me talk at a conference or they've seen me talk online at a virtual conference and they kind of know me. And I, I always make sure that I present myself as someone who's professional with integrity um, and, and I, it's really, really important to me that they, come to me and they trust me and that they know that I can match them with someone who's right for them. So every VA that I match them with, I'm essentially vouching for. So it's, it's really that personal connection. Like I'm not just a faceless company. I am me. And it's important that I get to know the clients who come to us before we commence any matching. So that's, I guess the, the, the thing that makes me stand out is, yeah, it's, it's my kind of personal brand that I want to kind of precede the company itself. So Maria, so at what point should a, someone consider or bring on, actually bring on a VA at what pain, pain point when they're just like they're overwhelmed, so they do it before the mm -hmm. overwhelm, like when you recommend people like bring on a VA? That's a good question because I think you said it as well. Um, bring them on before you're overwhelmed because you're going to need them more than ever when you are overwhelmed. So you want to have someone who can take the reins a little bit when you're kind of drowning. And that means bringing someone on possibly before you think you're ready. And I can tell you, you're probably ready from the very, very beginning. But I know a lot of business owners are scared to spend that money. They're scared to invest in a business that they're not sure might work. Um, but if you have a virtual assistant kind of learning the ins and outs of your business from the very beginning, they can help you build a more organized business. They can get your systems in place. They can get their, your SOPs in place so that you're really running a well-oiled machine by the time you have scaled to a place where you're potentially overwhelmed. So get that sidekick in from the very, very beginning as soon as you can. And, um, and you'll be, you'll be good to go. And I know it's scary. I know it's scary, but it's, I, there was something else I was going to say and it was so good. And now I can't remember what it was, but definitely hire before you think you're ready. Is right. my advice. <laughs> how, how you talk people to this? I think a lot of small business owners, they're like, okay, I know when I hire somewhere else, but if I hire somewhere else, they're not going to do as good as me, right? You know, a lot of mm -hmm. people don't get the fact, you know, you might do 100%. Well, first of all, you're probably not doing 100% good anyway, right? You're, 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 mm -hmm. you're you know, deluding yourself. Mm -hmm. And they, and they're not good with somebody else doing at least 80% good. How do you talk to people like, hey, you know what? You know, train this other person up. It won't be yeah. as good as you, but it'd be 80% at least. And that time be better spent, you know, doing other things. Yeah, exactly. That, that's exactly it. Like just because you can do something doesn't mean you should do something, right? You need to be focusing on your zone of genius and you need to hand off the reins to somebody who potentially might do it better than you actually, because it might be their specialty and they'll probably create a system that you've never even thought of. So th that's the thing I was gonna say. Um, Virtual assistants provide so much more than just kind of the day-to-day -day tasks. They're also, there's also this kind of accountability that they kind of um, come with. Basically, they're holding you accountable to doing certain things. Like when you have a team member, you are accountable to them. You have deadlines to meet together. You have goals to achieve together. Like you can't let that team member 
down. They're kind of counting on you and you're counting on them. So it's kind of having that partner that really helps you get that momentum and stick with it. So it, it, there is an element of like letting go. Absolutely. And that's hard for so many people, but you, if you do want to grow, if you do want to scale, you have to be okay with letting go. <clears throat> Sorry. And that's easier said than done for sure. I mean, I'm testament to that. It's really, really hard for me to let go. And I actually enjoy doing so many of the things that I've hired my VAs to do, but I just know that I'm going to be stuck at the same point in my business if I don't let go of these things so that I can focus on the bigger picture and the big ideas and implementing those big ideas. And you kind of, you kind of, it's a really fun place to be where you can kind of think of really big ideas and then share it with your team and then they go off and do it. Like it's kind of magical. Mura, so what's your recommendation for people as far as supervising VAs? Like, I mean, obviously no one wants to be market managers, but how, how, how should someone supervise them? Like they're making them do daily reports, weekly reports, like what's your recommendation on that? I think, um, I think weekly reports are, are more than enough in terms of like everything that was achieved this week. I recommend business owners meet with their virtual assistants, um, like on a zoom call or whatever, at least sort of once a month, if not once a week, ideally, um, depending on kind of the level of responsibility that they have. But I, I think there's a lot to be said for meeting in person and talking things through and, um, a lot of sort of great ideas can come from just having a conversation um, and just checking in every week to make sure that all your goals are on task. And then I would definitely recommend sort of setting a time, setting aside some time every quarter to kind of review how the working relationship is going, kind of like how we do reviews in the workplace and kind of ask them, you know, what is working for you? What isn't working for you? What can we do better? Um, and give them the space and the opportunity to share their ideas and to be honest about either the workload or your communication style. Just really have that open and honest conversation that can help you improve your relationship and your um, working, your workflow. So Maria, a, a VA's journey paid by the hour or by the project? They are, I would recommend that you start off hourly and then once you get a nice a sense of kind of what kind of work they're doing and they also get a sense of what kind of work they're doing and how much long it takes them um then move on to kind of a package rate so i recommend that my vas start sort of sell packages like 10 hours or 20 hours a month they invoice them ahead of the month and they get paid at the at the uh, before the month sorry my kids are going nuts and um, yeah, so you basically buy packages of hours. That's what I would recommend. So I, I, I'm probably wrong about this, but it's like most VAs come from the Philippines. Is that true or, or and if so, why is that? Um, I don't know if most VAs, a lot of people do hire VAs from the Philippines because the cost, their rates are very low. Uh, the cost of living in the Philippines is a lot lower. So what would be a very low rate for us in the US is actually a really good salary for someone in the Philippines. And um, so that's kind of the one big attractive quality of hiring from the Philippines. And um, they also speak English. There's a very common language there. And I guess not to be very generalistic about it, but they're also very, um, um, organized and, and committed people in general from the Philippines. So they, they make great virtual assistants. So if, if you're like, say you're V in the States and you charge like 12, like 12, 15, $20 an hour, how do you compete with somebody from the Philippines and how, how do they do go about that? It is hard. It is hard. Um, the, the advantage of hiring someone from your country, from the, sort of that side of the world is obviously the time difference. So if you needed someone to be on your team, and be sort of, I find that the ones who, the, the virtual assistants who charge a little bit higher are more committed to your business. And they're the ones who have the potential to become full-time team members. They are the ones who 
will take initiative, they will share their ideas, and they will become, like I said, invested in your business in a way where they will, they will actually help you to grow it. Uh, my experience with virtual assistants in um, other countries, other parts of the world where it might, they might be cheaper, is that they will, they will do kind of the smaller repetitive tasks, but not necessarily give you ideas in terms of strategy or you know, ways to grow your business. They're not as invested is my, my personal experience. And Maria, you actually have a course to teach people how to be VAs, right? Can you talk about that? Yes, I do. I have a six module course. It's completely self-paced and it's a video recordings of uh, every step that you need to take to launch your virtual assistant business. So from figuring out what kind of VA you want to be to identifying the skills that you already have that you can start charging for to branding your business, to setting up your website, to marketing yourself, to finding clients, to creating your services and your packages. It's everything that you need all in one place to really figure out the bones of your virtual assistant business. And as well as that, we offer trainings on um, the most popular tools used today by online, online entrepreneurs. And we're constantly um, bringing experts in to talk, us about, talk to us about the latest tools. Like Instagram Reels is really huge at the moment. So we're kind of bringing somebody in to talk to us about Instagram Reels, about Clubhouse, LinkedIn marketing, all that good stuff. You, can, you can't really keep up with all the changing trends, but we have to. <laughs> Yeah, social media is a beast, yeah. Uh-huh, yeah. Are you on Clubhouse, Jason? Yeah, yeah, I'm on there. Okay, I don't have an iPhone, so I'm I'm banned until I oh. until they make an Android version. Um, can you talk about some of the tools you recommend for VAs to, to use? So I think you should have a client relationship management tool, which will help to create a really professional, streamlined experience when you're onboarding clients. So a tool like Dubsado, which will help you to send out contracts and invoices automatically. Um, a time tracking tool like Toggle, that's completely free. Um, you need to know how you're gonna get paid. So you need a PayPal business account or a Stripe account. Um, you need a project management tool like Asana or Trello or Airtable is fantastic as well. Um, those are kind of the main, main tools. And then of course you need kind of a Zoom account or a Google Drive account would be fantastic for sharing documents as well as holding meetings. Um, I think those are the main tools, yeah. So how, how, what's, your, what's your thoughts on Airtable? Have you, have you used that yet? I have, I've, I've just started using Airtable and it is like Excel on steroids and I love it. Do you use it? No, I just got an account. I got to find the time to figure it out. Everyone says great things about it, right? That you can do all this magical stuff on it. So I just got to figure that out. I use, I use it for my content management. So all of my content is on there and I can easily switch it around and, you know, change, change the status of it. It's fantastic. And you can add pictures to it. It's great. It's great. I love it. I didn't know about the pics. Um, mm -hmm. How do you go about um, telling or, or taking your VAs the business part of being a VA? Like you said, the taxes, the um, pain, all that kind of stuff. How do you go about doing that? The taxes and stuff, we have a workshop from a legal expert um, who and an accountant who kind of, it, it's diff it differs every part of the world. So I wouldn't, I don't want to be the person to advise on that because it's just such a sensitive subject and it, it differs, it changes all the time and it differs in every part of the world. So we have someone come in and, and teach us on it regularly. Um, but in terms of running their business, we, um, yeah, we have workshops on that. Yeah. And then can you talk about your Facebook group? My Facebook group. Uh, it is. Yeah, we've got almost 2000 members in the Facebook group. It's the Start Market and Grow Your Virtual Assistant Business Facebook group. It's quite a mouthful. I am looking to change the name, but I've been running it for three, four years now. And it's full of just women who want to become virtual assistants. And that's where we run our five day challenge which is a fantastic five days of everyone just moving out of their, stepping out of their comfort zones, smashing their fears, getting visible and 
getting clarity around what kind of business they want to build. And it's magical with everyone supporting each other and encouraging each other. And a lot of people come out of it like with a completely different perspective on their how they can earn money. And it's it's wonderful. Maria, who is being a VA not for? Like what what type of people is not for like characteristics should someone not have to be a, a yeah. successful VA? That's a really good, I've never been asked that question. And there's, there's some very obvious things that would make you a terrible VA. So attention to detail is huge for virtual assistants and is the, the main reason why entrepreneurs hire virtual assistants because entrepreneurs are big thinkers, right? They don't look at detail, they look at the bigger picture. So they need to hire VAs to look at the detail and look at the things that they wouldn't look at normally so that they can be corrected. So if you don't have attention to detail, then you need to be, you need to not be a VA. Um, bad organizational skills. If you're, if you're scattered, if you don't manage your time well, you're not a great VA. If you can't stick to deadlines, you're not a great VA. If you're not a good communicator, you need to be a really good communicator. Ask the right questions. You need to, um, know what task you're doing inside and out. If you don't know what the task is, then ask the questions. And that's amazing. It's, that's a really obvious thing to, to say, but it's amazing how many people are scared to ask the questions that they need to ask to do the job correctly. So you cannot be afraid to ask the questions. And um, someone who, who doesn't ghost their clients. <laughs> um, unfortunately, there have been a lot of VAs who, who just ghost their clients. And I've heard horror stories. So don't ghost your clients. I'm guessing every type of business can use a VA, right? There's no business out there who could not use the VA, correct? Mm -hmm. I, yeah, I can't think of a single business who wouldn't benefit from hiring a virtual assistant. Like, yeah, you need a virtual assistant. Like, I don't know how any business can function without one. So here's a question for you. Like, what do you tell those people? I'm kind of making this up on the fly. Mm. Is there any time where, where a business owner like hires a VA and they get criticized by, by people like, hey, why do you hire this VA for? You should, you should hire a full-time employee, you know, you paying benefits, you be doing all this kind of stuff. And they get, and they get yeah. criticized for hiring a VA. What do you say to mm. those people? Well, I, I've i never heard that. I've never had that happen before, but I would just say, if you don't need somebody full-time, then why should you hire somebody full-time? If you only need two or three hours a week, then that's why a VA would be perfect. If you need someone to handle something very, very, very specific, like your inbox, like why would you hire someone full time to to manage your inbox um, if you only need them for an hour a week? So it's it's a really a flexible situation that that benefits everyone. So it makes sense. Yeah, I don't know if that's wrong or right, but yeah, yeah. it makes sense to me. So let's change this up a little bit. So you're originally from New York City, correct? Mm-hmm. And so in the previous yeah. life, you, you did, you, you, you did, you worked for, I believe, a film company, you did, you did film stuff. Yeah, um, I did film you, stuff. You were a film publicist. Back mm -hmm. in high school, you spent a summer, I think, Paris at some kind of film academy. Can you just talk, yep. you know, a little about your journey from New York City to where you're right now? And like, how you became an entrepreneur and all that whole process? Yeah, so my family's actually from Greece. So I was born in New York and I left when I was 11 and we moved to Greece and that's, I spent high school there. And then I went to university when I was 18, I came to England to study university, to study at university. And I met my husband there and that's where we are now. And so I never really spent too much time in New York. I left when I was 11, so I was still young, but I have always loved films. Like I thought from a the very young age from like six or seven, I thought I was gonna be an actress. Then I thought I was gonna be a director. Then I thought I was gonna be a producer. And kind of for a long time, I thought I was going to be a producer. That's where I kind of, that's it. That's what I'm going to do. So I went to college and I studied filmmaking and then I studied film producing afterwards. And I went to, yeah, you mentioned New York Film Academy, which is a film school. I went to Paris for a month to study film and make films and like all around Paris. It was just the, the dream when you're 16, 17, it was just insane. And um and yeah, I just, I was kind of like um, blinders. I'm just going to go work in film. So when I finished university, I interned at a few studios and I finally landed at one that hired me full time. And I was there for two years. We did 
we just insane things. Like when you're in your twenties and you don't have any other responsibilities and you're in London and you're working in film and you're hanging out with Johnny Depp and Angelina Jolie and Brad Pitt. And uh, it's not as glamorous as it sounds because when you're a publicist, you're essentially a glorified assistant. So it, it, it was fine for when I was like young and I, my career ambitions were kind of a little, you know, they were fine. It was, it, it was really, really fun. And it, it was, I, I left when I was, I left that company in 2011 when I was 20, when I was 28, 20, I can't remember, but I left that company when I was, yeah, in 2011 to move back to Greece and I continued to work with them remotely, but that's when I started my entrepreneur journey in like 2011, because I left London. It was a terrible time in Greece when I moved there because it was the economic crisis. There were no jobs. And I'm like, what am I going to do? Nobody was hiring, hiring in the film industry. So I kind of had to figure something out. I had my remote job from, so that's when I kind of started working remotely was for my, my previous employer. And I thought, oh my gosh, I'm getting paid from London to work from Greece. Like, this is insane. It was completely new to me. I'm like, if I can do it for this company, who else would hire me to work remotely? And that's where I came. I kind of did searches online, like working remotely and all that stuff. And that's where I came across the term virtual assistant. I'm like, this is pretty cool. Like I basically can do data entry on Excel and get paid $20 $20 an hour. Like what? Um, and it's, but yeah, that's it. I went on Upwork. I created a profile in Upwork. I don't know if you use Upwork, but it's, it was in 2011. It was, it was a pretty, yeah, scary place Upwork. Cause like you were saying with the, with the Philippines and other VAs, they were charging ridiculous rates. And I didn't know that that was not the going rate for a VA. I thought that was normal, like $5 an hour. And I'm like, okay, I guess I'll charge $5 an hour. <laughs> so I started my first job on Upwork was like $7 an hour. Um, but it was a great job. It, it was a great client. I learned so much from him. I learned how to build websites on Squarespace. I know how to, I learned how to do LinkedIn research. It was great. Like I never, I never regretted it. Um, but then I, and then I got lots of clients from Upwork. I started networking in Facebook groups. I got clients from Facebook groups. So it was all like, they were everywhere. Clients were everywhere. They were everywhere. Like in 2011, like it was the, the time, I don't know if you remember, it was like blogs were huge yeah. and like courses were huge. I felt, I feel like that was the time when like all of this digital marketing, marketing really blew up. And so everybody was hiring virtual assistants and I'm like, this is great. And I, I ended up having way too many clients that I could handle myself. So I started um, subcontracting and bringing on a team. And that's kind of when I turned my business into a, a virtual assistant agency. So I was, um, I was the point of contact for the clients, but then I would outsource stuff to my team. And about two or three years ago, after having done that for eight years, I was just kind of done working with clients, like working directly with clients. And I'm like, I want to go into teaching. Like a lot of people were asking me, how are you, how do you do this? How do you become a VA? And I'm like, and I would tell them, and I really enjoyed telling them and teaching them. So I turned, I kind of pivoted into a, a coaching and training. So I let go of all my clients. I let go of my last client about a year ago and um, focus and, and I'm now focusing on building my course and my program and my membership. So it's been a journey. It's been a ride. <laughs> So we we're back to the film stuff real fast. So, you know, mm. back in the day, only certain people made like only there's only like MGM grand, you know, a select few of people making the film. And now it's like Netflix makes them, Apple makes it, Amazon makes them. With more yeah. companies making films, is this a good thing or bad thing for the film industry from your point of view? It's not so much how many films are getting made. The big, the big controversial thing right now is how are they getting to the audiences? How are they getting distributed? Essentially, that is the big controversial thing at the moment where cinemas are under threat because of people like Netflix and Apple and Hulu. So I don't know, and HBO Max, I don't know if you heard Warner Brothers are going to be releasing all of their slate in cinemas. 
and, and, and on HBO and Max. HBO Max yeah. Like, like yeah. If, if you're a consumer, why am I going to spend like twenty dollars? Why am I always? Why am I going to go go to theater? Why would price mm-hmm. popcorn? Sit by people I don't probably don't like, yeah. you know, and probably a bad experience versus staying at home. So yeah, I don't know how movie theaters overcome that. It's 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 hard to get people to part with their money if they can just watch it at home, which is why I think cinema chains are really, really under pressure to offer like an experience when you're going to the cinema. If people are going to shell out $20, it's going to have to be an experience. Um, so that's, that's, that's the sticking point right now. The fact that so many films and, and content is being pushed out there is great i think because so many different stories are being told and so many creators are having the opportunity to have their stories made and told um the problem is of course that people's time is un- not unlimited so people have to be really selective about what they're watching right they can't watch everything and th- it's great to have all of this content but it's also overwhelming. Like, what do we watch next? Like, what are we supposed to do? Stay at home and just watch TV all day? No, there's so much competition now for our attention. So it's it, it's it's nice to see that competition because people and creators and people like Netflix, they're really going to have to pull the pull some create some really really exceptional content. If you're going to want, if you're going to you know vie for people's attention, your content is going to have to be exceptional. So I think the standard of the quality is going to have to go up. I think I remember reading this, hearing this somewhere a while ago, where someone said you know the golden age of TV was in the fifties, where they're mm-hmm. saying like this is like second second golden age of TV, but all the great content out there. Yeah, completely, be- completely, because the production studios now own the distribution methods, and in it, it, it's kind of turning into like yeah. The studio system again completely and it's and you see the same actors netflix i think is quite um guilty of this that they use the same actors like they it's almost like they have them under contract to do all this content with them so they're they're creating the content they're distributing the content so they're in complete control of what gets made and how it gets to people so it's yeah it is like the studio system again so are, are um, you still still involved with the film industry in any kind of way you're completely cut off from it now I am. I am involved because one of my biggest clients is kind of my second life. Um, I still work for a studio. So um, I, the, my, my first employer actually in London. And um, I was in house as well up until October for a popular streamer. So um, yeah, I'm still very much in the industry. Okay. And, <laughs> uh, back to the VA, the VA, your yeah. VA business. Do VAs come to you, or do you, or you have to go find the VAs, or are you, are you so, or it's more like word of mouth and VAs just reach out, or do you reach out to you now? They come to me. Um, they come to me because I, I kind of want to train them, um, in a way that I can, I can feel confident that I'm, I'm happy to kind of match them with the clients who come to me and who trust me. So they come to me. Um, completely new a lot of the time so it's women who have never been VAs before and I and I essentially train them up to be VAs and it kind of works in a way because their rates will be a little bit lower than what you would expect a more experienced VA to be so when we when clients come to us they have to fill an in a form to tell us what they need from a virtual assistant and one of the questions we ask is are you happy to work with a beginner VA and a lot of them say yes and so basically we're giving these women an opportunity to land their first clients. And that's really my mission is to help these women build their, their business and, and gain and get their first clients. And do you have the VAs figure out their pricing or is that part of the course that you give? It's part of the course. Yeah. So it will be based on the experience they already have. It will be based on their income goals as well. Um, but it is very much based on their experience for sure. And so you have a lot going on, you know, you're a busy person. How do you like prioritize stuff? Like you just, you, you like, you know, you use a calendar, you have lists, you just wing it. Like how do you just do all the stuff you're doing without going crazy? I probably wouldn't be standing if I didn't have my Google calendar and my Asana. So if not, if something isn't on my Google calendar, it's not going to happen. That's the end of it. And if, my task isn't in Asana, then that's not going to happen because my brain is like a sieve. So I need to write things down 
and I very rarely write things down on paper. It'll all be digital because then I can access it from all my devices. But every now and again, like every quarter or every start of the month, I'll, I've got like this big planner where I'll kind of plan out the month and I get these prompts in the planner, like, what are your traffic goals? What are your social media goals? And I'll kind of, you know, set some, set some nice goals down on paper. And that's quite impactful to kind of put things down on paper, it kind of makes it more real. And I feel so much more committed to achieving those goals. So yeah, so it's a mix of Google Calendar, Asana, and my planner. But lists, right. absolutely. Lists. Yeah. What, what's your vision for your company? Like you want to be the number one VA company in the world? You want to like have some percentage of, you want to like, you know, increase the number of, percent of VAs in the world by some percentage? Like what's your goal? Like your big time vision for the company? My, I have a goal by the end of the year, I want to help 400 women um, start their virtual assistant businesses and book their first clients and every client after that. So yeah, my, my short-term goal, my year, my, this year's goal is to get 400 women trained up with their first clients. And then my big vision goal is to kind of keep doing that, I guess, and help a thousand women and then help 10,000 women and to kind of just never ending. And I kind of, mm -hmm. I've always had this big dream to kind of be like a household name of some kind. So, you know, if anybody needs a VA, they'll come to Marina Karras Creative or some other name that I'm kind of trying to think of right now but that they'll come to me. Yeah, I have a branding issue. I'm, I'm I mean, most, most people don't realize most big name companies are like personal names, right? I mean, like yeah. Harley Davidson, you know, Gary Vaynerchuk. Um, every pretty big, name, big time brand is a personal name, if you think about That's it. That's true. That is true. Like I didn't think Harley Davidson, yeah, like Mercedes-Benz I mean, as well, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah. there was a commercial on TV one day talking about all the big time names is like, you know, you're not, you're not, they were talking about you're not buying the product, you're actually buying the brand and behind the name, which is this, this, and this, and it's yeah. like someone's name, right? That's why mm -hmm. so branding is so important. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. That's such a good point. So if suppose someone has been a VA for a year, how could this person determine, hey, you know what? I've been a VA for a year. I've been a successful VA. So any metrics they should have, like should they say, I help increase my business owner's revenue by such a amount, I, I, I increase customer retention or... Is there anything where a VA can say, you know what, I was successful this year? Or is just more need that's their own inner peace saying I was successful? Um, I guess that's a good question. How does a VA feel successful? I think it will be different um, indicators for every client, right? I think what I'm trying to teach my women in my course is that everyone has a different version of success, right? So that might be working less that might be you know being able to pick up their kids from school or being able to go on holiday once a year or twice a year like everyone has their own version of success so i just want them to be living their version of success and that doesn't always mean making more money um but when it comes to the clients i want them to feel fulfilled i want to, them to feel happy that they're doing that the work that they're doing and that they're meeting the the vision that their client wants. Um, and yes, I always tell them to brag about the achievements that they've, they've helped their clients accomplish. So if they've helped them, you know, 10 X their email list or um, get the yeah, 10 X their social media following, whatever, like they should constantly be um, shouting it out from the rooftops. Cause that's how you attract more clients to you, isn't it? So Every, every VA will have a different indicator of success. Mary, do you have your VAs find clients or that's pretty much on their own once they finish your course? They can find their own clients, absolutely. We give them that little leg up because we send them our, our clients as well. Like every week we'll do a, a newsletter with a digest of all the job opportunities that have come to us. And they're free to apply to as many as they want. And we'll look through the applications and we'll make our suggestions to the business owner as to who would be the best fit for them. So they're, yeah, they can absolutely go find their own clients, but then we give them that little advantage of sending them clients as well. How do you recommend VAs find their clients? Like this matter of going on social media to advertise for themselves, direct email mm -hmm. to marketing, or just word of mouth? How do you recommend a, a brand new VA to find a client? A brand new VA, honestly, the best place you can go to is the low hanging fruit. So that is your 
um, family, your friends, your personal network, just spread the word, tell them that you're starting this business, whether that's a post on Facebook, whether that's a post on Instagram, maybe that's an email, maybe that's a DM, tell them what you're doing. Most of the VAs, the established VAs that I work with now that are my friends and my network, they've all started that way. They all started with friends and family um, and they've been, and they continue to remain clients, you know, because these are people who know you already, who trust you. And it's easy. It's easy for them to, um, to, to, to trust you with their business. So definitely start there. A lot of VAs find this whole thing so daunting getting their first client, but it's really so much easier than you think if, if you just reach out to your network and the, the problem with that is that there are a lot of the times they feel like they should offer, they should work for free. And that's fine. If you do your first bit of work for free, so you can get some testimonials, maybe you want to build your portfolio, that's fine. But then don't fall into the trap of continuing to work for a family member for free. Um, you should be paid for your work. You should be paid for your experience. And that conversation needs to happen up front. So, yeah. <laughs> Maria. When should a business owner move off this VA? Like how, like how many chances should they give the VA? Like, like how many, how does that work in your opinion? Like when should a business owner like, you know what? No VA, this isn't working out, working out for me. I'm going to, I'm going to move on from you and move on to someone else. Mm. Are you saying when the, when the client doesn't like the VA anymore and they want to break up with them? Yeah. Yeah. Either they're the not producing like they want to, or there's a disconnect or whatever the reason may be. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what do I suggest they do? Well, that, I've never been in that situation before either. That happens a lot with virtual assistants in our group. Well, they'll come to us and they'll be like, yeah, this client is not a good fit for me. Um, the, the biggest complaint with, with clients from our VAs is that they don't respect boundaries. <laughs> like the clients will not respect boundaries. They'll email their, their, their VAs outside of working hours. They'll expect work to be done, you know, within 24 hours. And I think business owners really need to um, recognize and appreciate that these are not your employees. They do not work for you full time. These are independent contractors who have their own set of working hours and you need to respect those boundaries and also not expect the world of them when you're paying them like $20 an hour. Like that has been my biggest complaint. There is so much scope creep with virtual assistants um, it, it's a real struggle to kind of, um, manage that and navigate that. And I think it really comes down to setting expectations and deciding on the deliverables very, very early on. Like, it's not just about buying hours. It's also setting expectations on what you want your VA to do. And, and do so. most VAs do a good job of preventing scope creep? Cause there's a lot of VAs that they want like, no, do the boss wants, you know, they have a job. They want to you know. No, they're do don't, they don't do a good job. No. Okay. They don't do a good job. And, and that's what I'm trying to teach them because they're new VAs. They feel like, and they're working with their first client. They feel like, you know, I can't mess this up. I can't mess this up. I'm they just think gonna... If I don't do exactly what I'm told, I'll, I'll lose this job and I'll have a bad reputation. Yeah, exactly. But it's important that they either charge more if there's scope creep and they have that conversation with the client. Um, and they're clear from the get go, what the expectations are like, that's the only way to avoid it really. And that's where, that's where I suggest where you do your quarterly reviews, things like that can, can come up there, you know, and you can address them head on so that you can find a way to move forward. Yeah. I'm sure it happens all the time. You no, know, mm -hmm. can you do this? Only takes fifteen seconds or twenty seconds, right? Before you know it, you've asked them to do ten thousand million ten second things, right? And then, yeah, yeah, and it's 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 tricky though because you might get hired to do like social media, and then and then your the client will say, "Oh, can you make this PowerPoint presentation for me?" Which might not necessarily be within like your agreed scope of work, but but you might want to do it as a VA, you might want to do it so that you can, you know, learn PowerPoint and improve your skills. So it's in that sense, it's fine, but it's really up to the VA to kind of decide what they want to do and what they don't want to yeah. do. And they should feel comfortable enough to tell. Yeah, well, this owner, you're probably thinking, well, you, you're making my social media platform items on Canva. PowerPoint is just like Canva, so it's a big deal, right? Yeah, yeah. 
but it's it's fine when that happens because then you know the VA can 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 improve their skills and add that to their um, services. But you know it's it's they they can say no. I mean I think they should be allowed to say no if it's not something that they're comfortable doing. Maria, is there anything that I didn't ask you that that should have asked you? That's a good question. Um, you didn't ask me what makes a good VA, but you you asked me what makes a bad VA. But yeah. I think you can inverse that to know what makes a good VA. Um, no, I think you covered it all. Okay, so what does make a good VA from your point of view? I mean, organizational <laughs> skills, attention to detail, I think re detail. responsiveness. Responsiveness, yep, absolutely. Good communicator, um, timeliness. I have to think uh, some kind of decent personality, I would think. A decent personality will help. Yes, be a good person. Um, ask the right questions. Don't be afraid to ask the right questions. Um, be willing to learn new things. Um, be a good person. You know, if it's your client's birthday, send them a birthday card or a, you know, a That's cupcake. always a nice touch. That's always a nice touch. Yeah, completely. Um, be, be personable, you know? I think that goes a long, long way. It does. Um, mm -hmm. Maria, I understand you have something for our listeners today. Any, any, sorry, what? Yeah, I understand you have, some, you have some, something for our listeners today. Oh, I do. Have, yes, sorry. Um, I did mention this before. I We offer free v, VA matchmaking service. So if anyone listening is in need of a virtual assistant to take things off their plate so that they could focus on the bigger picture, then please, please do come consider using our free VA matchmaking service. Uh, you can find it at mariacaris.com forward slash hire. And it's simply just a quick form that you fill in telling us what you need. And we will receive your form, send it out to our network of virtual assistants, and they'll apply um, through a, a form that we create. We essentially create the application form, and then they will apply um, <clears throat> directly to us. Sorry. <clears throat> and we'll send you a list of all the suitable candidates that you can reach out to to interview. <clears throat> and Maria, can you share your social media links for yourself, your company, so people can reach out to you? Um, people can reach out to me. The best place to find me is um, on my Instagram. I spend a lot of time on Instagram. It's at Karis Creative. And my website is mariacaris.com. And to listen, if we have the links to her gift and the social media on the show notes, you can find the show notes at www.cabinetshallblog.com. And also here at Kevin's HR, we're launching a crowdfunding campaign for Kevin's HR on March 2nd. So go to HTTPS, CabinetsHR.co crowdfunding for more details and please donate and share. So Maria, we're coming to the end of our talk. Can you provide us any advice or wisdom on anything you want to talk about? Uh, my last bit of wisdom, I guess, would be, and I said it before, is if you're thinking of hiring a virtual assistant and you're also thinking of growing your business, um, then start now if you can don't delay hiring a team member they will they will definitely help you to grow your business to the the scale that you want so definitely consider it maria thank you for your time today i really appreciate it thank you so much jason it's been really fun and to our listeners thank you for your time as well remember to be great every day <laughs>